because so many of the things we talk about are more or less on the obscure side, it could well be a reasonable question to ask the origin of these various doctrines, particularly those relating to a period in the prehistory of the earth, about which science has very little to offer. And most formal theologies have but at best symbolic accounts. The doctrines with which we are concerned are very old. They have been traditionally received by ancient peoples, apparently out of some strange night of consciousness within themselves. We have to realize that man bears locked within his own being the complete story of himself. How we are going to release that story into objectivity is part of the future evolution of the race. But that man in himself has memories and strange stirrings dreamlike out of the past we know for at the root of every conscious and objective culture there is legend, lore, myth, strange beliefs which nevertheless have endured and have contributed broad patterns of concepts to our modern ways of life. Thus, the source of such information has to be internal, and the recovery of certain phases or fragments of it must be due either to the development of extrasensory faculties by the human being, or his willingness to accept the testimonies of others who have possessed such faculties. The average person cannot explore these fields for himself. On the other hand, there is something more to it than this. For out of the great scriptural writings of mankind can be gradually assembled a very powerful confirming tradition, a tradition that has the authority of man's first spiritual revelations given to him by the great teachers of his race. Many of the records with which we are now concerned have existed on a level of recording for thousands of years. Yet here in the West we know little of anything about them. We have not been able to restore the lost libraries of Alexandria. We do not know the fate of the great literary monuments of early Western man. In Asia, however, a somewhat more fortunate condition exists. For while most of the early records certainly are gone, they were faithfully copied and transmitted and preserved through schools of initiated philosophers, schools which still exist, and also in a literature of tremendous religious vitality. Uh, which is still a living literature and draws to it the best thinkers, the best scholars of these several Eastern nations. Thus our story is based upon a combination of ancient beliefs, records, transmissions. Records from Hinduism and other Eastern schools, Buddhism, uh, from the Avestas, the sacred writings of the Persians, uh, from the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, and the early uh, pre-classical remnants and remains of Greek thought going back to the period of Homer. All these records, when studied together, restore in general the story with which we are concerned. Therefore, the problem is to put these records together. 
to integrate and organize them, and at the same time to remind the student of the exact nature of this material, which is for his consideration, and which represents, we might almost say, some of the choicest remnants of the old learning of mankind. That this may or may not be demonstrable on a scientific level is evident. But as we unfold the problems more in detail and study the scientific findings of modern man with greater care and thoughtfulness, we observe more consistency between the two than might first appear. And we have much to recommend the thought that these old records become a very solid basis for many of the conclusions which we now hold to be true and evident. In the study of cosmogony, we have the growth of the human body, embryology, as a wonderful guide and aid. In the study of anthropology in general, we have the constantly recapitulating story of social growth. In the study of man himself, physiology and anatomy, even histology, become very valuable guides for all these stories that we talk about are repeated in the formation of man and the development of his functions and structures even to this modern time. So there is a tremendous analogical integrity about the story, certainly far more conclusive, complete, and satisfying than the simple concept that nothing from nothing comes, or that the beginning of everything was nothing and the end the same. Thus we have a validity which inspires further thoughtfulness and study, and the recognition that we are in the presence of a very profound explanation, deeper and more complete than those explanations which we follow today. And incidentally, most of the beliefs that we now hold from arbitrary sources are no more demonstrable, no more, no more provable than the ancient traditions. It is simply that they are sustained by a greater number of persons, and the weight of number gives authority. So we will continue our study. We'll go back just a tiny bit, not departing essentially from astronomy or from the basic concepts of the universal machinery as it is known today. And perhaps we are in the presence of an interesting point that within the last hundred years we have confirmed hundreds of principles and points of interest previously held to be arbitrary opinions. The progress of man in scientific research is sustaining the ancient tradition more with each passing year. So we have a certain confidence based upon this. We go back then to the story of our planet in the age of the fire mist. That such an age existed is almost a scientifically accepted fact. It is among the favorite hypotheses of modern learning. The old East Indian records tell us that in the days of the fire mist, the earth was enveloped with this strange luminous envelope, which we described last week, and which extended far enough from the surface of the Earth to include the orbit of the Moon. This was a strange, swirling, luminous, gaseous state of existence in which the semi-molten surface of the Earth was covered with these strange fumes, perhaps resulting from the impact of cold space upon a hot, evolving body. In any event, this mist extended far out, surrounding the entire Earth with a flaming, luminous envelope, like the incandescence of a gas flame. Gradually, through the course of time, the cooling of the Earth resulted in the gradual diminishing of this misty envelope. It reti retired by degrees towards the surface of the Earth separating as it did so into two essential elements. The heavier parts falling became water. The lighter parts remaining in suspension became air. And the struggle between air and water, still preserved in the story of rain, continued for a long time until at last 
Water adding its own weight, the humidity to the surface of the earth, we had the gradual cooling of the planet, and by degrees it became what we would term today conceivably inhabitable. Now what is an inhabitable planet? We're talking about it all the time now in our recent thinking in terms of space travel. We're wondering how we would function on some other planet. A habitable planet is simply a planetary body capable of sustaining an organized or evolving form of life. That this body might be entirely different from ours is entirely immaterial. That we could not live upon a certain planet does not in any way imply that it is not inhabitable. Because in the development of bodies, they are derived from the planetary elements and the planetary available materials. And bodies must therefore always be compatible with the general body which they inhabit. Thus, any type of material which is capable of being molded by consciousness, directed by mind, or possessed by emotion, can, and inevitably does, become a habitable form, a kind of form which can embody a living principle. In the course of the changes in the early history of our Earth, for example, uh, for a very great part of this history, man as we know it today could not have survived here, could not have had an existence upon this planet at all. Yet not only did man come here, but perhaps prior to man, many forms of life that are now extinct flourished, finding no more essential difficulty in their manifesting than we do in ours. All these problems are a little of little concern to the archaeologist because searching for human artifacts, the archaeologist and the anthropologist depend so heavily upon fossilized remains. It is obvious that fossils could not exist at a time prior to the construction of forms such as we know them. But perhaps it is well pointed out by the Tibetan philosophy that first man had no bones. Therefore, he had none to leave in the rocks. But this does not mean that he did not exist. <laughs> this does not mean that a kind of life could have cultured and flourished and developed a great civilization without leaving any artifacts such as we know. If they did not have these kinds of bodies, they would not need these kinds of houses. They would not dig holes in the sides of hills. They would not sharpen the tooth of the great cave bear. They would not have created stone implements, nor molded uh, primitive uh, pottery and other artifacts. All of the things that we find belong to a kind of creature like ourselves. And if there was another kind of creature that did not need these things, then naturally we would find no familiar remains relating to him. In the old tradition, therefore, we are told, as I explained last week, that the release of evolving forms of life uh, comes about uh, when the bodies suitable for the manifestation of living creatures reach a certain degree of development. The planetary logos, as the Greeks called him, the deity whose body is the earth and who is a living creature. Plato called him the eternal animal crawling through space. The Chinese represent him by the ancestral turtle carrying the world upon his back. That this earth is therefore alive. That all life evolves from within and not merely is imposed upon the outside of things. The ancients in general did not believe in an extraneous deity. They did not believe in the kind of God who sits in heaven and uses the earth for a footstool. They believed in a kind of God that is embodied in creation and is forever releasing itself from creation and through it. And therefore that all growth, all development, all evolutionary process is the eternal releasing of an eternal spiritual energy. It therefore means that in the course of the gradual development of a planet for life growth, 
But there comes a time, as in the case of the human embryo, when it is quickened, or the life which is responsible for the formation and development and protection of it becomes indwelling. And from this point on, molds its form from within. And from the time that it is so locked within form, it is held as in a prison. So that form or body becomes indeed the sepulchre of the soul. And that from that time on to the great processes of growth, life is escaping, resurrecting, regenerating, reviving, bursting forth from the shell of matter in which it has been locked for the great involutionary processes. Now in the old tradition, uh, the earth itself finally is recognized as the physical body of the planetary lobos. But before that physical body was generated, other bodies had been generated. Gradually this being coming into incarnation created a mental body, then an emotional body, then a vital or etheric double, and finally a physical form. Whenever a body is released into manifestation by the generating power of a creating principle, and these bodies were released within the consciousness of the deity by what the Easterner calls will and yoga, generation by the power of the will, not generation as we know it. Whenever a body comes into existence, we have what our uh, various orientalists term a plane coming into manifestation. A plane is an area of manifestation, usually the vehicle of a superior being. And in this plane, when it is created, life is released. Thus, when the mental body at the power of the planetary uh, spirit was finally integrated into an organized structure, invisible but very real. A host of beings asleep in the mind of that deity and waiting for a mental world in which to live. When that body reached, reached a certain degree of maturity, these beings came into existence or into manifestation, inhabited that mental body and became the natural citizens of a world invisible to us, but no more intangible to them than the physical world is to our type of creation. Being properly adjusted by vehicle and instrument to their own world, they live in it. Not as we live naturally, but in perfect comfort so far as their ability to function was concerned. So out of the mind of deity, of the planetary deity, forming the mental body of the earth, were born the sons of wisdom and the sons of night, or the lords of wisdom and the lords of darkness. And these creations were invisible to us, but formed part of the great order of hierarchies, even referred to in the New Testament. When gradually the emotional body of the planetary being <coughs> reached its maturity, another order of life was released into manifestation. And this order of lives developed upon what we call the plane of the astral life. And they had their proper organization, civilization, and culture just as we have. And when the etheric or vital body of the planetary Lobos was fashioned, another order called the order of the lunar ancestors came into manifestation. These represent to us what Paul calls, in ascending order, angels, archangels, and principalities. And uh, as far as our earth is concerned, man is therefore one step lower in this great pattern. But when the physical body of the earth came into manifestation and passed through its preliminary unfolding stages over periods of millions, hundreds of millions of years, it finally became habitable and tenable. And at that time, the sleeping souls, which we call humanity, uh, were brought into manifestation as the fourth great creation. They then began their gradual process in which they are still engaged, the process of mastering the environment in which they are placed, and learning to function adequately within it 
to release the spiritual potential within themselves and ultimately graduate from it. Thus, in the descending order of things, in the invisible worlds around the visible planet, in the rings which we mentioned the other night, the concatenated spheres with the physical earth in the center, gradually these orders, or hierarchs, came into manifestation and began to brood over or meditate upon the surface of the earth. These beings never did actually take upon themselves physical forms as we know them, but they became the guardians, protectors, leaders of the flocks of souls that were later to take upon themselves physical embodiment. Records, legends, myths, fables relating to these things are found everywhere where angels and archangels or devas and spirits are recorded in the ancient classical writings. We've never understood very much about these celestial beings. Uh, for many hundreds of years, we've assumed that an angel was a certain uh, kind of being, a sort of Western Union messenger service between spiritual and material worlds. We know, actually, that what we call angels are really a life wave just as much as we are that this life wave is invisible to us, perhaps equivalent to the description given by Socrates when he said that with his inner perception or vision he perceived that there were races living along the shores of the air as men live along the shores of the sea. Thus the world is full of life and full of beings and full of peoples, full of creatures growing. And to each of these orders their own world probably is the only one that seems real and all the others seem strangely unreal. But this very space around us is filled with souls, growing and unfolding within their own orders of life. And within the last 25 years, our study of space dimensions is beginning to open to us the possibility that sometime we may be able, uh, mentally and perhaps actually, physically, of crossing these space boundaries by which things in the same place remain unknown to each other because of space or vibratory interval which can perhaps be discovered in the more recondite dimensions of time and space and the reaction of these two factors upon each other. In any event, we see gradually uh, this mysterious uh, hierarch or order of life moving downward into manifestation. And we find then at the beginning of the so-called embodiment of earth creatures, the gradual beginning of man, the support for the old esoteric doctrine that man was the first of creations as far as the physical planet is concerned, that he was actually older than the animals, older than plants, and actually older than minerals. We wonder how he could be older than minerals and plants, or how could he live here? That is because when those periods of evolution were in process, man did not live upon the earth but in the subtle atmosphere surrounding it, the atmosphere which was gradually condensing. And he had vehicles far more subtle than anything we have today, and yet he existed. So we begin now to estimate in what way we can this drifting of human souls out of the will of God, out of will and yoga, the deity releasing orders of light from itself. And as the proper bodies are fashioned these forms of life coming into manifestation. Now let's pause and think about this for a moment in terms of something less fantastic because we are more familiar with it, but actually less fantastic only because we think we are familiar. We know the human being begins as a monocellular organism in the process of prenatal development. We know also that this original cell, the cell which is the original unit of man, is never lost. That this cell does not break up to form cell fission or the multiplication structure. That all this fission takes place within this cell and that which was the original cell becomes ultimately the epidermis or outer surface of the body. And cell and structure continually multiplies within this. Now in the process of building structure, for example, man, whether he knows it or not, begins also to release his populations, his races, his creatures, his plants, animals, minerals, are all released as living things through the development of his own prenatal structure. 
because all the cells in his body, all the minute structures, which must not ultimately become essential to his security, the very living things which make up bone and muscle and nerve, all of these are orders of living creatures that come into manifestation as his own prenatal development permits. Order after order of cell structures are brought out of the everywhere into the here. They have slept in the period between incarnations, but they have slept within the structure, the psychic structure of man himself, and have invisibly been carried like the mysterious creatures carried over the deluge of Noah in the fabled story of the ark. Thus man growing is forever bringing forth orders of life. When growth begins at the fifth, sixth, seventh year, orders of life are suddenly multiplied like races. At around the fourteenth year, orders of life of another kind are released, carrying with them powerful animal or emotional impulses and structures. Again at maturity, other orders of life are released. And these orders of life are then said to have entered into incarnation and to have become like races or waves of life, citizens of the human body, which ultimately is made up of more living things than the population of the earth. In fact, it is probable that if we tried to count all the living things within man, we would come out with a sum that it would exceed all the human, animal, and plant organisms on earth, all growing out of man, all developing and unfolding, coming into incarnation. Man himself is totally unaware of this procedure. Yet these various lives coming into manifestation also must have general directives beyond themselves. Bone structure, muscle structure, nerve structure, the separate cells are not completely self-directive. They may be able to maintain their own brief destiny, coming into life and out of life again maybe in a few seconds, in the tiny cycle of rebirth which they know. But to each of these orders there must be directors. So we have centers around which this growth proceeds. And a cross-section of the bone looks very much like a solar system. The cross-section of structure reveals organization. And it also reveals that at each of the levels of these populations, there are what the Greeks or the ancient Assyrians called kings, emperors, princes. There are governors of all of these different processes. For over each of these groups of cells is a still older and wiser cell. And over these, in turn, still others, until a cell organization follows the solar system, passing from a planet to a solar system, to a cosmic system, to a universal chain, and so on and on and on. Thus, it is not inconceivable to realize that the great embryo of Earth produced life in exactly the same way. We are saying nothing that cannot be in general traced or repeated in our own processes of growth. It is simply a kind of extension of biology into anthropology and cosmogony. So with this uh, brief thought of defense, we can proceed with our original supposition. Namely that at the beginning, when the fire mist was still heavy, when the gradual cooling of the earth had scarcely advanced to a marked degree, what we call human beings today, or the ultimate type of life, which was to become human, was first seen, sensed, or known, had there been anyone to see it, as shadows. Mysterious shadow-like distortions of this misty field. These shadows were comparatively shapeless, perhaps uh, roughly small clouds. They were somewhat more dense than the fire mist, but they were able to exist in it because they in no way greatly differed from it. They were derived from its very structures, and they gradually crystallized or precipitated with it, so that with the passing of millions of years, 
as these mists began to settle and began to slowly divide into water and air, uh, these shadows remaining with the watery element descended into that condition in which science believes man originated. Science believing in its famous and traditional charts and graphs that man originally came out of water. He was, however, gradually precipitated out of the fire mist. And as this cooled and became more dense, these shadows, according to the old tradition, uh, became somewhat more dense also, resembling perhaps what we call an amoeba. Now these shadows were never the kind of amoebas that we know. But amoeba is a most intriguing creature. The amoeba is a universal genius. Actually, although we have little respect for him and very slight social contact with him, he is still in all ways completely delightful and a constant source of admiration. The amoeba probably resembles more than anything else a small, a small raw egg. But in spite of the fact that it is comparatively transparent, has no functions that we know, no organs that we can conceive of, no nervous system, no brain, no spinal cord, no mind, no emotion, no taxes, nothing that we have committed. <laughs> the amoeba does exceedingly well for himself. Well, this mysterious little creature is deficient in none of the things I have mentioned. He is simply universal in all of them. When he is hungry, he is totally stomach. When he is not hungry, he has no stomach. When he wants to go somewhere, he is all locomotion, nothing else. When he has arrived, there is no more locomotion factor and ev anywhere evident in him. If he is in danger, he has a kind of universal sensory perception. Every part of his mysterious jelly-like structure consists apparently of a full developed five sensory perception. Anything approaching him in any direction he knows about, although he has no nervous system, he must be all nervous system. Any part of himself becomes a mouth at will and encloses anything that comes along. Wherever the mouth is, the stomach is nearby. <laughs> He's all stomach. Thus this creature seems to carry within himself a universal power to specialize within itself any and all of the functions which we recognize. In this way, he is startlingly correct. We would expect him to be correct, and that what nature does is done correctly. But from this creature, there is no doubt that any specialized power we have, from sensory perception to cathedral building, could well be um, developed. He is a total potential, first expressing this totality in a total impulse to survive, working with a subtle substance which responds so inevitably to the superphysical part of the being that most of the links, binds, and ties which we know are not even necessary. In the ancient tradition, we are taught that this cloud-like thing, which was man, before he knew anything about life as we experience it, was in this way also a total being. And that in the evolution of man, this amoeba never died, never ceased to exist, never broke up, never divided, but that all growth, like in the growth of the cell, took place within it. And it still remains the totality of man supplying the total field of potential. Gradually, as in the case of the egg, 
the local nucleus of the cell began to develop specialization, drawing for its survival upon the albuminous field. And therefore the body or the mysterious depths of this transparent anemic organism became a perpetual nutrition for the maintenance and development of the central nuclear structure. Now when this central nuclear structure begins to develop, it not only has to have nourishment, but this nourishment would lead to something. And in the case of the development of the creature, this nourishment leads to the release of cell structure and the in infinite multiplication of cells in the formation of structure. Therefore, not only nutrition was concealed in the protoplasmic field, but also sleeping in this transparent albuminous part were the seeds of all the cell life that would ultimately be manifested through the center nuclear area. Thus, all these forms come from their own circumference to their center and engender there. The same thing happened in this story of primitive man. Primitive man in those days began to draw upon the total resources of this strange cloud, uh, which was a cloud of unknowing so far as he was concerned, but which contained everything that he could ever need. And at that time, we are told that these cloud-like, semi-amoebic structures in a misty, humid element, half air, half water, gradually crystallizing, becoming more and more dense, uh, that this structure, this strange, shadowy glob globule, was immortal. It never died. Therefore, this form is the only immortal form that we know. When I say immortal, I use it relatively. It goes on for ages and ages, for aeons and aeons. In other words, that this form, this nuclear body, is the first and oldest form and will continue so long as form endures. It is within this field that our division and cellular integration began to manifest. And gradually, within this tremendous area uh, of potential, tremendous in power rather than in size, we see the gradual evolving of man. There is no accurate recording as to the exact size of these clouds, misty shadows. But it has been suggested by early study of records and texts and comparisons that probably the human amoeba was perhaps 10 feet in diameter. And that therefore within this was ample material for the gradual development of structure, structure and form as we know. These forms, these beings not only lived upon a level, they permeated many strata of the Earth's atmosphere. And instead of all living merely upon a surface, they permeated a field extending several miles from the Earth in all directions, even at this late date. And originally, of course, as we say, this field extended beyond the orbit of the Moon. Gradually, out of this condition, the hardening of the Earth, the seas becoming tepid, becoming gradually uh, cooler, still however retaining a certain warmth, the type of warmth that might cause an egg to generate. These structures took on increasingly physical form and began to grow. Not growing in size, but growing by means of internal division. And first of all, this growth began to take the form of the division of the central nucleus. This division of the central nucleus resulted finally in the appearance of the amoeba of the yolk with two egg, uh, the egg with two yolks. Each yolk half the size of the original. Each of these by fission divided again, producing two others. Each one half the size of the preceding. This division continued on 
to produce the kind of situation that we have in cell life. In other words, we have an infinite multiplication of cell life. But there was a difference. Namely, that gradually these nuclear centers, by continuous division, having, without, having no power of enlargement or growth, passed on by division into so minute a type of structure that they were utterly diffused. They passed gradually out of existence by division. But this division in no way interfered with the nucleus. Therefore, these divisions finally caused the nucleated center to disappear entirely in the albuminous field. It returned to it again, producing nothing that survived. Everything broke, divided, 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 till it passed to infinity. In the next stage in this development of creation, therefore, a kind of fission took place by which a nuclear center became twofold. And then each of the halves received the power of growth and became equal in size or intensity to the original. This was called in the ancient times reproduction by budding. And this reproduction by budding continued for a very long period of time. Later, this reproduction was extended by what are called uh, birth through spores and through pores. Uh, live forms were actually exuded from various parts of the amoebic surface, any part of which became in its own turn a womb and gave birth. All of this goes in the very early struggle of life to achieve what we call integration. These processes, we are told, ran riot. Until one after the other, they exhausted themselves, as though someone in a laboratory was experimenting with various laws. One of the reasons why these experiments were frustrated is because the various laws that were drawn in to operate were left without common reconciliation, and for the absence of some other law, the previous ones failed, until gradually the entire pattern of the great septenary of laws that we know about came into existence, and it was only then that an enduring structure created by law was also protected by it, because each one of the laws operating singly would run to the extinction of itself. Only through their common union could these laws produce permanent uh, generations. All this happened during what we call the Polarian period. And in the course of this vast uh, length of time, we see the structure of man gradually becoming more and more firm, more organized, and a certain internal specialization beginning. This first specialization was the establishment of sensitivity uh, around a core which was later to become the cranial or brain center. This sensitivity was originally in the center of the organism. And this sensitivity was not obscured by any bony, fleshy structure such as we know today. And around this first primary point of sensitivity, there gradually evolved uh, what we call today the pineal gland, which was the earliest individualized organ of man. It was not an organ of sight, it was an organ of cognition. It was an organ in which was focused all of the uh, reflex and sensory attributes of the field of the old amoeba. Just as the solar system gradually concentrated so that from the great field of the original body of the sun, the elements were gradually contracted to form ultimately the luminous sun ball itself, which is in the center of its own field. So the sensory gamut of the field of the amoeba gradually retired to the center to form also its own 
point or, or central focus of cognition, not yet specialized. And this cognition we call the pineal gland. This gland, therefore, combined all of the sensory faculties necessary to primordial man. Primordial man now representing our friend Emila, who is, however, gaining considerably in stature and dignity in this procedure, and now has reached what some of the old writers call the pudding bag stage. The pudding bag stage being a somewhat better organized uh, structure resembling an old-fashioned English plum duff. This pudding, which seems like a sack tied around the neck and with a kind of a little fringe of the upper end of the sack extending above the tying knot. So it sort of looks as though you had tied the sack and you had a kind of little neck of the sack standing above, wrinkled because of the tying. This then corresponded closely to the estate of man at that time. And this little neck of the sack, tied around and seemingly extending outside of the rough sphere of the sack itself, became this organ of specialized orientation, which at that time extended outside or beyond the common structure of the body. This uh, little structure had a number of functions. It had to do with nutrition, observation. It had to do with the sensing or awareness of danger. It had every orientation possible under the conditions of its own existence, which conditions were extremely limited. But this also had an internal awareness. For at that time, this creature had greater internal consciousness than external. And it was alive in a superior state and comparatively dead in a physical state. Its uh, cognition materially was almost nil, barely enough for survival. But its internal cognition of its own origin and nature was were still strong, or was still strong, and able to therefore have a life of kind of internal meditation in which it still dwelt in space with its sister worlds. It was not bound to the body as we know it. As time went on, we see the same thing happening that happens with the amoeba. amoeba. When an amoeba wishes to make a trip, it extends itself. It sort of streams out from its own center, creating what are called pseudopodes. And these pseudopodes are merely extension of the mucus-like substance of the albuminous field. But wherever one of these pseudopodes extends, Immediately, the rest of the amoeba all flows into it, and it takes up its new position. It simply is continually flowing into the extension of itself. This is also one of the best definitions that we have of creative imagination. For creative imagination is always moving in front of yourself, extending some part of your consciousness, and then the rest of you flowing into it and making this dream or ideal a reality. So you always extend beyond what you can do in order to grow. And from that point on, you move in behind this extension until you make it solid. <laughs> then you extend again in some direction. And so progress is continuously a kind of an anemic trotting from one state to another. <laughs> Perhaps the most gentle flowing that we've ever had in motion and the most graceful is that of the amoeba. Now, when uh, man uh, became aware gradually of this specialized field, which he could gradually control more and more with this central nucleus, which he was developing, he had probably the same basic inducements to move that the amoeba has. Motion with primitive creatures, primitive life, is always related to two things, nutrition and escape or, in this case, defense. The purpose of the, of the living thing is to survive. To survive, it must find nutrition. To survive, it must also escape danger. And in that prehistoric world, it was mostly danger. And these primitive forms of life gradually involved not only the pseudopode, but ultimately the extension of uh, members 
so that these members were available for the great problem of escape or defense and also, of course, for nutrition. Thus, our original creature began to assume a proportion and a shape. The shape, finally, and the proportion having merely uh, to do with environment, for the body is always built in terms of the situation in which it is placed. It must always meet a kind of need and must supply an instrument for the life within it. And out of the experimentation and struggle of ages gradually emerged the primary shadow of man as we know him. A strange to the being, perhaps, some have said, looking very much like a man in a diving suit, even more strangely grotesque. A creature considerably larger than man, as he is today. For there were giants upon the earth in those days. And the early forms of man's most rudimentary construction was pro were probably from 12 to 15 feet in height. Now at this time also, we begin to see crystallization moving in upon the individual. And this crystallization had a considerable effect upon the gradual locking of life within form. We are told, for example, that in one stage of man's early development, his physical body was about the consistency of the pith in a hollow reed. It was more fibrous, uh, more almost like a very soft wood uh, than flesh as we know it. The crystallization working upon it from the outside, as opposed to the vitalization working from within, these forces were unbalanced at that time, and the outside forces were much stronger because, in part, of the terrific pressure of the changing world around the living thing. Uh, the defensive side of the body had to be intensified, the body had to be protected, made more durable, given a hard surface or shell with which to protect itself, whereas the light within was still feeble had to energize this form. Dante in his Inferno describes the trees that walk, and perhaps this is a vision of things in the ancient Polarian epic. Through the passing of continuous time, however, these forms are described in the words, and there were hard bodies that softened, and there were soft bodies that hardened. And that which had been originally the hard surface softened, and that which had been originally the soft interior hardened upon the bone. And the protection or, or covering became less and the central skeletal structure became greater. In all these processes also the need for the specialization of sensory perceptions intensified. Until by degrees man began to gain the instruments and organizations that he has today. We know for example that his eyes began within the brain and only after a great period of time moved inevitably to the surface. Certainly he would have no eyes until there was something to see worth seeing, until sight became necessary to him. And every faculty and perception that he gained came only when a world situation around him made it necessary, made it advantageous to his growth and suitable to his need. Gradually the Polarian epoch produced these rudimentary creatures that were asexual in structure. Reproduction such as it was known of it was spontaneous and internal, as in the case of a certain number of small minute organisms even today. And these organisms are the archetypal remainders of processes that once ruled the whole world. Now as the situation gradually passed and man's first integration in the coarse, rough structure of himself took form, we are told the first great age or the Polarian came to an end. The first great continent reached its completion. And these strange rips that had shot down from the polar cap and have become land areas within molten and hot uh, fields, either with these gases or with hot water, with volcanic vents keeping it 
constantly agitated, that this first primitive prehistoric world gradually ceased, or we would say was absorbed into the next great epoch, which is referred to as the Hyperborean. Now, the Hyperborean, as I told you, is a, a term used by the Greeks to represent the land which is above the winds, or the land uh, where the terrible ice and snow never come. Thus, the Hyperborean world, in a certain mysterious way, was a paradise. It was a land of great beauty, a land in which everything was strangely wonderful. It was not a paradise such as we know it, but it was a gradually developing world of clemency in a previous inclement sphere. Uh, the, the great tides of air and fire, the great motions and combustions were slowly ceasing and out of this came a broad, quiet world. And in this broad, quiet world, the problems of survival began to change. From the uh, immediate need to devote every resource to physical continuance, <coughs> there came the secondary stage, in which hazards were reduced. And as a result of that, the motions of growth change their objective purposes. From survival came therefore the new uh, incentive, orientation. And these primitive forms of life began to have a kind of strange pre-human leisure, a situation in which it was no longer necessary for them to struggle to protect themselves against the terrible combustions of nature. Their problem now was to orient themselves and find a wonderful pastoral world, a world for their own growth. They had, were given a respite in which to uh, consolidate progress. And in this long respite period, we find the gradual sensitizing, perfecting of the great structural form of man. We find him increasing in uh, development, we find him becoming more uh, like what we know, we find him developing hands and feet, adjusting himself to more subtle activities than previous, but still remember only a body with this same glandular power, the pineal gland, his principal instrument of orientation still awake and alive internally, living in a heaven world or a world above the earth, living almost and still in the mind and emotion of the Creator, and not as yet actually precipitated into a physical existence. Therefore, the being itself, which was within and behind this power, lived in a gentle dream state in which it was aware of its origin, of its spiritual relationship to life, but was still compelled race, actually. He was referred to as a species. He was a type. His spiritual entity within him was not called an ego, it was called a monad. It represented an entirely different, diffuse, subjective kind of life. And this continued on into the Lemurian world, a vast distribution of land which centered primarily in the area where we now call Southern Asia, Australia, and across southwardly to the Western Hemisphere as far as certain areas of South America. This tremendous area produced the gradual integration of man. Still, however, his life strangely linked to his internal. Now, in the beginning of the Lemurian world, something else happened. The thing that I want to point out in connection with the development of the human body 
in the prenatal epic, <coughs> namely that organization set in. Uh, organization set in, in this sense of the word, that man gradually evolving was approaching the time in which his central consciousness focus was going to be shifted from the internal universe, where he was still oriented, to the external universe, where he was not oriented. In other words, in a strange way, he was going to come into birth. And when he came into birth, the inner eye was going to be darkened. The eye of the Dhamma was closed. The eye of the gods was darkened. And when this was to occur, the human being would be sightless. Because up to that time, the physical eyes had not sufficiently developed. More than sightless, however, the human being was going to be in a perpetual night as far as consciousness was concerned. This newly half-fashioned brain, more primitive than anything we know today, could not possibly carry the conscious experience of himself. He therefore would become a kind of animal, less than an animal as we know him today, a creature wandering around, capable of a kind of motion, capable of a measure of pain and misery, capable of all kinds of reactions to environment, and yet incapable, as yet, of self-administration. And it was then, according to the ancient tradition, that the, and during this period, that the parental power moved in in the form of the great mystery schools. The mystery schools being derived principally, according to the ancient tradition, from the hierarchies of the planet Venus. And these mystery schools moved in in the parental capacity. They were to be the fathers and mothers of the sleeping race. They would have to supply from the outside the power of the shepherd king. They would have to become the leaders and directors of this new human race or kind until this race was capable of administering its own destiny. So according to the old uh, Ion records, it was at this time that the great mountain of Miru became the home of the gods. And it was at this time also that the great heart center of Shambhala was set up. And the mind and heart that was necessary to man was supplied by these orders of adepts became uh, the ancient ones, the strange messengers of the gods who came from other worlds. And it is said that when the lords of Venus, as lords of wisdom, did bring their message, their message and their presence to the earth, that they also brought from their own planet something for the service of man, and that and left it with him to remain a mystery which he has never been able to explain, and that is the mystery of wheat which is supposed to have originated on Venus and has become the bread of life. So the uh, ancient principles or the ancient protectors, the lords of Venus, were returned to some the lords of the shining face and they were the guardians of the children of the sun and moon and they were the leaders and ancestors of the great rishis sages and saints who became the teachers of mankind. Gradually the human race, the human structure was moving towards further integration. And in the fourth subdivision of the seven parts of the Lemurian cycle, the scales tipped and the species became a race. And this, occur, this occurrence was the result of a series of factors precipitated by nature by the great laws of inevitable growth uh, under the direction and under the administration of the, of the great schools that have been founded to protect and maintain this process. Two things occurred that were of the greatest importance. One was the establishment of man's present upright carriage by means of which he tuned his spinal cord into the vertical energy moving from the earth and also the descending ray of the sun.
The second was the differentiation of sex and the end of the androgynous being that reproduced itself. By the differentiation of, of sexual polarity, nature brought into action one of its great laws, the law of polarity, which we will discuss when the time comes. And by means of this, the great magnetic field, uh, which was behind the physical body of man, uh, broke and formed what we would say a broken letter eight, or number eight. The circle divided, and one half of the generating circle was turned upward to energize the brain. Thus each individual had a polarized brain and a polarized reproduction process. And these processes were balanced in the heart to which the two extremities were the polar extensions. The individual therefore became psychologically male-female through brain polarization and physically male female through the pol polarization of the generative power. The poles were the opposite in the two sexes. Therefore, in both the brain and on the material level, both were required to establish equilibrium. The brain, however, began to develop a rather peculiar situation. The brain early indicated the rise of an androgynous structure within itself. And this becomes part of a future evolutionary pattern that is not yet complete and was represented by the male-female halves or hemispheres of the brain with their two generative organs, the pineal gland pituitary body. Here we had the beginning of the entire integration of psychic alchemy or psychic chemistry within man. But in the Lemurian period, this division took place. Eve was taken from the side of Adam, so to say, and we had the rise of creatures as we know them. Now, with this procedure, several other things happened. Man, having reached this polarization, the internal power of vision was gradually dimmed. The dimming of this power of vision brought man psychologically to the great dark curtain that divides human memory from the pre-state from which it came. Gradually the eye of the gods was darkened and the individual was precipitated into this mysterious sphere of unknowing. The single eye closed, the two eyes in due time opened and man saw a world around him and no longer remembered a world within him. This caused him to become a sort of orphan, a wanderer, uh, forced to uh, earn his bread with the sweat of his brow, forced to go forth and wander upon the face of the earth, searching for the promised land. In the uh, Lemurian epic also, we see certain other things beginning to manifest that are important to us. It was at this time that the power of speech was added to man because the speech center had much to do with the positive pole of the generative system. It is therefore that man is said to be able mystically and religiously to create with the larynx and therefore will create by means of the spoken word. There are many uh, important elements involved in this symbolism but many of them also rest in the future of things. But man gradually developing speech center and power of speech mimicry derived his earliest sounds from nature around him. He attempted to copy the sounds of animals, birds, other creatures, and also the natural sounds, and through mimicry gradually gained the power of self-expression. During this period also something happened that means very little perhaps to us, but became a tremendous factor in evolution. Man is composed of five elements, four, and a mysterious fifth element, which is called Akasha in Asia, and Azoth by Paracelsus. The four elements are represented by the fingers on the hand. The mysterious fifth element is represented by the thumb. The primitive man, like the anthropoid and even the monkey of today, had a thumb which was a fifth finger. In the, uh, in the Lemurian era, 
the thumb was separated from the finger and fingers and moved against it. So that from that time on it was not another finger. And with it came the individualization, gradually, of man's ability to advance the power of self-will. For self-will has long been associated subtly with thumb. And man is the only mammal with a thumb. And this seemingly has become a distinction. He's recognized many other distinctions and bids for glory, but he seems to have overlooked this one, which is perhaps uh, one of his greatest attainments. It took him a long time to get that far. But now he disparages the whole thing, but when he's particularly awkward, says that he's all thumbs. But really, it took him a long time to get that good. With this became, with this thumb working against the fingers instead of with it, man became the architect. Man became capable of making things. He became capable of discovering fire, of creating pottery. He became capable of making crude instruments, of holding the primitive hatchet, of doing various things which the animal could not do. And by his thumb, he had gradually obtained victory over the rest of creation around him. This happened in this period also. And gradually, during the Lemurian epoch, but particularly in the last three divisions of it, we see the emergence of the world we know. It was pretty crude at that time, rather primitive, perhaps very much like some ideal geological landscape of the ancient world as we restore it, where all the plants looked like asparagus and all the animals were 30 or 40 feet high. But this was the primitive world, the world in which man first gained a consciousness of his own existence. It was here that he began to think as a human being, awaking by degrees only from this strange dream and losing with it the dream of the heavens and the invisible spheres of which he had come. Here now it was necessary for him to bear his kind in pain. Here it was necessary for him to defend his young. Here he became suddenly a responsible being in nature. And it took him a long time to achieve all these ends. Gradually the Lemurian period drifted along toward its natural termination, but before the end came, man had done one more thing that was interesting and important. He began uh, to move great masses of rock. And out of this period we begin to find what are called the monolith builders. They carved no stone, as we would say it. They inscribed nothing upon rock. But they raised great monuments of rough stone, mostly untrue. They created these strange dolmens in which actually the only proof that we have of human participation is that the stones are placed in arrangements which would be totally impossible in nature. Therefore, we know that man somewhere passed that way. He seems to have had the beginnings or the foundations of his religious instincts. And most of these very ancient remains were apparently monuments to the strange gods he worshipped. Now, in this period also, he was under the leadership of these progenitor leaders who came to him. And these progenitor leaders did not come to the Lemurian man as some strange, wonderful sage descending with a long white beard from a mountain. These lords of Venus actually took upon themselves the bodies of the Lemurian people and worked through them so that they were apparently their own kind. But they were the ones who were different. The ones primitive man still records that of a tribe or a group, one or two would have a strangely internal neurotic kind of life to become the medicine priest 
the Holy One. When they took on these forms, the lords of Venus were no longer internally conscious of their own destiny, but became involved in this tremendous motion of society. Now also in this period of uh, the Lemuria, this division took place in these hierarchs. Some of those that were wise, called the sons of wisdom, took upon themselves the bodies, the daughters of men, and came and dwelt with them. And these became the ones who contributed the tremendous impulse to the development of brain power and the psychic life of the internal man. In other words, they intensified it through mingling with humanity and bestowing through reproduction their own power upon this primitive form and hastening its growth. Another group refused to perform this, remained the virgin Kumara, the ones who would not be born. And they in turn were further divided. And among those that would not be born uh, were to later come the not only the saints or great sages, but also uh, the beginnings of black magic and sorcery. That group divided. But those who would be born became the progenitors of a higher order and prepared the way for the next great wave of life which was the Atlantean race. And in the rise of the Atlantean race, we come upon a people now advanced to a state which was essentially our own. Uh, the Atlantean is still with us. The Lemurian remnants are still with us. All of Lemuria is inside of us, and all of Hyperborea is inside of us. And because we have a skin, we are still inside of the Polarian species. But all these things were developments of great motions of life. The Atlantean began to unfold arts and sciences. By this time he had conquered the prehistoric world. The great mammal monsters of the past were gone. The, also the monstrosities that were bred from those, from those who did not receive help from the Venus ancestors or the lunar ancestors, but remained bodies. These are the ones that are said to have united with beasts to have produced monsters that became sterile and thus passed away the kings of Edom and all those who were upon the earth in ancient times. So the monsters disappeared. The monsters described by Sankraniathon in his Phoenician history. The beings with many heads and many arms. The strange creatures with the bodies of men and the feet of serpents. The same described in Aeneas in his pilgrimage to the underworld. These monstrosities were those that did not achieve these degrees of development and the forms perished and the life went on in other forms. But by Atlantis there had been a general organization and the fourth race brought with it a kind of world which was not different in essentials from our own life. The Atlantic diffusion, as I said before, was not merely a continent, but a general arrangement of the entire Earth's surface and the Atlantean peoples, migrating to various places, created commerce and industry, diffused the great religious systems of the time, uh, were still under the control of the adept kings, and created the first empires. Now what happened to the Atlantean is one of the great riddles of history. Uh, the old tradition tells us that the tragedy was due to the fact that the mental nature of man is twofold in structure. Man has a positive and negative polarized mind. And the negative polarity of the mind is what we would call physical mind or mortal mind. And the positive pole is divine mind or spiritual mind. These two poles have to finally be balanced. But in the Atlantean, they were not balanced. 
the Atlantean emerging through his own corporeal structure, but still locked largely within body, produced the progenitor of what we call materialism. He was strong, he was skillful, he was keen, but he lacked reflective power. He lacked the power sufficiently generated uh, to enable him to estimate the moral and ethical values of existence. In his earlier period, this moral, ethical, spiritual directive was provided by the adept school. But in the middle period of Atlantis, the time came for the individual to pass out of the protection of the adept system and toward self-determinism. In other words, there comes always the problem in parental guidance as to when guidance must stop. If guidance is prolonged beyond need, the child is damaged. And the need for the Atlantean to become self-responsible as a moral agent forced the gradual retiral of the shepherd kings or the initiate teachers, the great sages, who retired from society into their schools, which means that they retired from embodiment. They were no longer born as Atlanteans becoming part of the race. They retired into their own higher uh, natural forms and became teachers. As teachers, they were available but had to be solicited. The disciple could still seek them, but he must search for them by a decision of his own will. Their help was not inevitable. He must desire it, he must demand it, he must respect it, and he must obey it of his own accord. This severance, in which the parent, though still available for counsel, no longer recognized the need to determine the solution for the child, this division resulted apparently in the destruction of the Atlantic Empire. Inasmuch as the Atlantean uh, deprived of parenthood or parental guidance was unwilling and unable to make the adjustment to moral individualism. As a result of that he became tall with pride. He said we are the great people of the earth. We are the rulers of all things. We do not need the gods. And there are ancient records that say that these people denied the gods to exist and said that their own human will was strong enough to rule the world. They accepted nothing superior to themselves and said that knowledge was the only thing by which worlds could be conquered. As a result of this arrogance, as described by Plato, the gods in their great assembly upon the Olympian Mount decided that it was necessary to chastise these people and to remind them that any excess of destructiveness must either be blocked or it will ultimately corrupt the soul as well as the body. And so to preserve the souls of these beings from the tyranny of knowledge and from magical arts and from the spells and incantations of the Dugpas, the entire continent was destroyed. But before it was destroyed, the teachers selected from it all who were not themselves corrupt, led them out of the Posidonian Isle, and through a long and circuitous route brought them ultimately to Asia. So that when Atlantis sank, those that had deserved a better destiny had already departed from it. Those who did not deserve a better destiny were held in suspension for rebirth in a new order of life where their experiences uh, would enable them to reorient. Out of the collapse and rubble of the Atlantean world, 
and particularly out of this order of life that have made the pilgrimage from the site of the ancient Poseidonian culture all the way to the vast trans Himavat of Central Asia. From this, the nucleus of the next or the fifth race began to develop. The race which the Indian, the Hindu particularly, calls the Arya, or the selected, the chosen, the destined, and which we have involved in our term the Aryan race. Now the Aryan race uh, is said to have been under the leadership of a great teacher or a great being who was called the Manu. And the institutes of Manu were given by him, presumably through his sages and scholars, for the preservation, direction, and guidance of his people. From himself he produced seven sages who were the seven sons of light and one of these also gave to the world the great teachings of the Puranic literature which describes the origin and development of these people and one by one the great rishis or sages like Vyasa revealed the law. The Vedic writings were also given and then in the course of time the will of the Manu was uh, impressed upon the entire culture of his world. Now it is said that after the great migrations and the, the, the long and difficult troubles that were attendant upon the formation of the race, there is an ancient legend that the iron race as we know it began with 25 families which alone have survived the name numerous vicissitudes which were involved in this tremendous migration and also in the tremendous culturing process that nature was attempting in this womb of races high in the mysterious land of Gobi. In any event, the Manu, or the leader, became not only the father of the race, its teacher and its progenitor, but he bestowed upon it, as was always the case with races, bestowed upon it the seed of its own survival. And the race lives because of the generative power of the Manu, who set in motion the line of descent and made the race fertile rather than sterile. The Manu also, the great leader of the race, has been absorbed into the race itself and is part of its internal structure and will emerge only when the race is complete. Now this race, starting its tremendous migration, broke into a number of sub-races, for each race has seven sub-races. And each uh, species prior to the individualization of a race in the earlier period had seven sub-species. The, the Lemurian was unique. It had three species, three sub-races, and a link between them which was a combination or joining of species and race, or the tipping of one into the other. The Atlantean had seven sub-races, and the Aryan has seven sub-races. Now, of the seven sub-races of the Aryan, the first, of course, was the father-mother race, the total body of the Aryan. This total body of the Arya is embodied, personified, and represented psychologically by the great archetypal symbol of the Manu, who is the race. The race, therefore, becomes his children, his progenitors, and the division or individualization of himself through the race. It is also the Manu, or the power of the race, that must ultimately be restored or resurrected through the restoration of the race. In the perpetuation of the species, 14 divisions of Manus are established. Seven arising at the beginning of sub-races and seven at the ends of sub-races. And these 14 together represent the great legal structure or extensions or differentiations of the one leader or the one teacher himself. They are the witnesses or manifestations of his power. Up to this time, there have been five of the sub-races of the Aryan race that have appeared. 
The first was re re uh, generally is termed the Arya constructively and represents the great Indic race stream rising in northern Asia and flowing down through this great valley of the Indus through the Indo-Gangetic plains finally moving southward. The second race or the second sub-race of the Aryans was the Aryan Semite and the Aryan Semite differing from the Atlantean Semite moved into what we call Syria and the Holy Land and became a distinct race the Syrian, the Lebanese, the Arab, and the uh, Palestinian Jew are all Aryans because they belong to the second great branch of the Aryan people. The third great branch was the Iranian, which moved into Persia and all that vast area at that time. The fourth division was the Celtic, which moved all the way across producing the Greco-Latin civilization and finding a strange and mysterious abode in Ireland. The fifth was the so-called Anglo-Saxon Teuton, which is essentially the, uh, the racial group of which the, to which most of the uh, modern Western people belong, although the division is quite confusing. But these five migrations or divisions of the great Aryan race have led us to our present state. Now, let us go back for a moment and consider this racial structure from a little different position. And that is try to visualize a, a diagrammatic presentation of it. Each one of the processes of creativity which we recognize is orderly in nature. And each one of the species that preceded man and each of the races that followed his individualization um, are part of a geometrical pattern uh, that unfolds with perfectly sequential growth structure. From the second species of the Polarian uh, total species, and the second subspecies of the Polarian, the second race or the second species, the Hypoborean, was created. After its creation, a differentiation took place. The old or Polarian epoch continued to its natural end, but the German seed of the second species came from the archetype of the second stage of the first species because this represented one major step in growth. The third group, the Lemuria, therefore came from the third subdivision of the Hyperborean. And the fourth group, the Atlantean, came from the fourth division of the third group, now a race, the Lemurian. And the fifth race came from the fifth division of the Atlantean order. And the sixth root race will come from the sixth subdivision of the fifth. And so on, all the way down. Until the seventh race is born from the seventh subrace of the sixth. Thus each of these becomes a step. And once the step is made by what were called the pioneers who follow the direct line of race, then the races themselves begin to drift away, the carcass of the old race slowly drifting away from its place in the direct stream. And progress is always moving with these new groups that break off. Today, therefore, we are concerned with the sixth sub-race of the fifth race. This sixth sub-race must come into existence before the sixth root race can be born. Many questions have been asked as to where this sixth sub-race will come into existence and under what circumstances. First we know this, that a race can never be born from a homogeneous people. It must be born from a heterogeneous people. In under the law of polarity, a homogeneous people cannot generate. 
Therefore, wherever a new racial structure develops, you must have some kind of a polyglot. You know also that by means of this polyglot, a tremendous vitality, a new chemistry is set up. And a new racial structure, like the new wine, must have a new bottle to contain it. So gradually, out of the development of races, arises a polyglot. Now the second thing that is essential to the rise of a root race, or even a sub-race, is a land area. They will never come into existence in a small region, in an island or in some isolated area. They must come in to a large continental distribution because this continental distribution which they take on and where they are created must survive the destruction or the great shifting which is going to result in a sixth continent for a sixth root race. The continents must change, but there must be this vast area suitable for the promotion, development, and propagation of a species or of a type of life. Now the question as to where the sixth subrace of the areas will be uh, generated has been a question. Many people have thought, and of course perhaps with some egotism, that either what we call the Western Hemisphere or perhaps the great Australasian area will have to be the seed ground for this next sub-race. There are many who believe that on the Western Hemisphere as we know it today, a new sub-race is actually being formed. A sub-race in which uh, many differences are noted between our culture and that of any other culture of our race. That we are producing almost a new biological type. That by degrees, out of polyglot, out of the mingling of peoples, the pioneering spirit, the various enterprises that we are indulging in, that we are creating a distinct pattern, which in time will be the source of the new sub-race. If that is true, then out of that sub-race must be formed the sixth root race. Now that will mean a division, because after the formation of the sixth sub-race, there will be another sub-race to close the cycle. But this sub-race will be a kind of anticipation or a foreshadowing of something, but will not in itself be fertile. The fertility will rest in the sixth subdivision. And this sixth subdivision, if it produces and does fulfill, will give us the sixth root race. Therefore, the sixth root race must be born to a measure or to a degree somewhere in the great area where the sixth subrace of our race functions. And the sixth root race, we are told in the old writings, will have certain changes in it by which Gradually, through modification, the individual will have abilities or values which we do not have. One of the anticipated processes which is to be noted in the sixth sub-race of the fifth race, the one we are somewhere close to, is the gradual unfoldment of the extrasensory perception gamut. The sixth sub-race will gradually gain possession of the extrasensory band. Now this extrasensory band, as we know it, is only a magnetic psychic band. But when this reaches its culmination in the birth of the sixth root race, this will mean clairvoyance on the psychic or emotional level of life. It will mean that man will have an internal perception that the sixth root race therefore will be a race which is the first that we will ever know that cannot have a secret. <laughs> now if you do not think that will change the course of history just wait and see. 
that the entire sixth race will have apperceptive or intuitive, inevitable and infallible knowledge. It will mean a total change in everything that we know. Everything, even transportation, housing, communication, cannot escape this. This one thing alone will change the total structure of our culture and change it in the most inevitable way because it is changed by the individual from within himself, his new relationships. The second important thing will be the increase and rapid development of the autonomic nervous system what we call, or used to call, the sympathetic nerve ganglia, or the soul ganglia. This means that there will be a gradual restoration of the androgene state of the, per, of the first primitive creation. And with the rise of the psychic ganglia within the individual, almost all processes of the body will come under the conscious will of the individual. His heartbeat will by, be by his own will. Also, by means of this development of the sympathetic ganglia, his control of such things as sickness and death will be very much greater than anything that we know today. In compensation for that, however, his sight will be restricted because the process is again under development then by means of which internal vision will be thrust upon him. We wonder how man can be torn away from materialism. Nothing can do it as quickly as astigmatism. <laughs> <laughs> the moment the outer life of man ceases to be focused within his sight perception, the entire structure that he knows will begin to disappear because he will develop then corresponding internal inducements. This does not mean that man will become blind, but that the thing will happen which has been more or less threatening for a long time, namely that man will develop increasingly what we call nearsightedness. And this nearsightedness will carry with it a magnifying or microscopic quality man will begin to perceive forms of life that he previously did not know to exist. And the combination of the extension of his extrasensory gamut with the development of microscopic sight and the voluntary control of processes of growth, assimilation, and even to a great degree of death will result ultimately in the sixth root race man becoming an entirely different looking creature, an entirely different conducting creature than anything we know today. Yet he will retain in general what we term his human proportions. But these will be refined and very highly specialized and will reach a point in which society, culture, education, religion, philosophy, these things will be strongly internalized and the total life of man will begin to move into him or move into his inner existence rather than being posited on the outside. His greatest environment will be his own internal. From the seventh sub-race of the sixth root race, an almost inconceivable projection into the future will finally come the seventh root race. And we are told that this race, like the first, will originate in the trans Himavat of Central Asia. This will be the race of man going home. It will be the return or the release of the gods and the godlings that have been locked in human psychology for millions and hundreds of millions of years. The seventh race, therefore, represents uh, the production of a race which in the Indian mind uh, might be represented by Shiva the mendicant seated on the top of the great mountains of the north. Well this is the, the race again of the great uh, sacrificer of the great mendicant. For in the seventh race 
the meditational or internal life of man will take over. In the seventh race, man will live, think, function by the perfection of those faculties which we now associate with yoga. Man will attain the normal function of Raja Yoga. In that period also, the internal mental extrasensory perception will be completed and he will be completely adjusted to the phenomena of internal and eternal universal thought. As the mendicant, he will then have completed and concluded his objective wanderings in time and space, and we will find him again retiring into the conscious meditation, drawing into himself and back into his own consciousness by degrees every form of life, thought, and emotion which he has externalized in the evolutionary processes. Then having attained, finally, complete union, having absorbed all the races within him back into himself again, he will approach the rest, or the pralaya, the sleep between orders of life. And when they awaken from this order of sleep, a uh, man will start upon a new cycle of growth, which will take place on a higher world entirely from, which he, from what he has known and where what we call physical matter will no longer exist. He will then continue on his evolutionary course, having escaped from the strange and mysterious density that has locked him here. We have another point or two that uh, the ancients tell us, namely that these cyclic periods required for the evolution of races and species decreases in time as racial evolution continues. They decrease in time because time decreases in significance. Uh, the Polarian period may have lasted for many thousands of millions of years. The, uh, the Aryan race is only a little more than a million years old. The Atlantean race had a survival of between four and five million years. The Lemurian race species extended for more than 50 million years. So as each evolutionary procedure progresses downward, the length of the racial spans or species spans is shortened. It is therefore very likely that our race will not endure for more than a comparatively short time, perhaps not more than a half or three quarters of a million years. This is something to really worry <laughs> especially in long range investments. <laughs> it is quite possible that the sixth sub race will appear within the next thousand or two thousand years. It is also quite possible that the sixth root race will be born within the next hundred or two hundred thousand years, born to the degree that we become aware of it. And it is quite possible that the sixth root race and its total extension will not survive more than a half a million years. These periods are constantly decreasing in time for the reason that man is outgrowing the experience boundaries placed by time. We realize this even in our daily living when we hear someone say, well, more happens to us in a year than happened to our ancestors in 50. We know this is happening. We know that the psychic life of man is functioning much more rapidly than ever before, that this tempo continues, and thus man's increasing consciousness is forever contributing to the rapidity of his growth in these various cycles. And as we get nearer to the end, the cycles diminish in length, so that the golden day we look for may not be as far off as some have imagined. We are past that terrible nadir in which uh, we confronted uh, the Atlantean deluge. The fourth subdivision of Atlantis, the division which led ultimately to the deluge, and from which the fifth race began, from the survivors. The fourth division of Atlantis was the low point in the great, uh, the great involutionary arc of man. At that time, the evolution of man reached its lowest and most material state. And from then on, evolution has taken over. <laughs>
and growth is now inevitably and eternally upward. Man may, as he usually does, ascend a little like the crab by walking backwards. And in every cycle there are arcs in which things fall away and there seems to be a loss or a breaking up, a death of something. There are what Plato calls uh, sequential eras of sterility and fertility in nature. And there will be materialistic ages and there will be idealistic ages. And there will be scientific ages and philosophic ages. And there will be times in which it seems that man is bent upon destroying himself and other times when his nobility will shine forth with unusual splendor. But in all these ups and downs and curves and arcs of human progress, the ancient tradition tells us that we are inevitably moving upward. And that what we call reverses are now actually pressures exerted to make more rapid our progress. Because every reverse now is met by a greater equipment within man. And because man is better able to know than ever before, he is better able to meet adversity and grow directly as a result of it. This goes on and on and on, and means that the cycle of races is shortening, and that the degrees of attainment are also increasing in importance. The ultimate degree being that of the return of the race to its homeland, the close of the great cycle of humanity which closes where it begins in the mysterious Northlands of Asia, where the race goes home to sleep, and where once again uh, the earth receives into itself uh, the souls and beings of these creatures. Bodies then go to sleep, souls now consciously able to leave them, depart and return to their own estate, and await embodiment in the next great order of life an order of life infinitely higher than what we have. The first war was fought by the Atlanteans. The last war, it is said, will be fought before the end of the fifth root race. And that in the sixth and seventh, war will be unknown. And with all these changes, we know that the only way in which darkness and ignorance and death can become unknown is because the experience of man penetrates them. They can never be exiled, they can never be legislated out of existence. But when physiological, biological, and psychological changes in man make these things impossible, then the individual, feeling no frustration upon his natural life, chooses to follow the growth of the talents and abilities which he can no longer deny. Thus, by degrees, man outgrows everything that is inadequate and attains to everything that is necessary. And also, by degrees, I think you'd better go home. <laughs>